Thank you, Karen Syred, Marilyn Matthew, Joseph Cox, and Claire Musho for that beautiful slideshow with which to welcome us here today. Hello, everyone. Thank you all for being here today and a very warm welcome. My name is Catherine Cox. I'm an analyst from London and a member of the WJ team. Before we start, just a quick reminder to select your preferred language from the globe icon on your Zoom screen. If you cannot see the globe icon, please look for the row of three dots and the interpretation should be there. So we have a number of people to welcome today. Firstly, as always, a very warm welcome to you, our Ukrainian colleagues, wherever you are in the world today. We're always so pleased to see you. When we had our first event, not long after the full-scale invasion by Russia 19 months ago, little did we imagine that it would still be ongoing today and that we would be gathering together again in this way. In spite of Russia's overwhelming might and numbers, Ukraine has not fallen. Its resilience, courage and determination to defend itself has won admiration around the world. In some parts of Ukraine, the bombardment by missiles continues on a daily basis. The city of Advika is currently being bombed to smithereens. We have heard in these webinars of how our colleagues manage sessions in spite of it all. We're very pleased to welcome here today Anne Ulanov and Mr. Berg, both of whom played key parts in the first event. What can we tell you both of our journey since then? Well, since you were last with us, Anna Missa, our colleagues in Ukraine have lived and worked through atrocities of every description. The numbers of dead and wounded mount and almost everyone is now affected. About 18% of Ukraine is currently under Russian occupation, an area of approximately 100,000 square kilometers. In our last webinar, where the Ukrainian speaker came from the Donetsk region, we learned about the reality and terror of that brutal occupation. At a recent meeting with UDG members, they described to us that this is no longer even a marathon. They do not know when they hit a wall, how much further they must still run. Ukraine is now in its second winter at war. The civilian population is suffering power outages. The economy is suffering badly. Civilians and soldiers are weary. Ammunition supplies are running short. However valiantly Ukraine resists, their fate does not rest solely in their hands. How difficult it must be to realize that even though you're making enormous sacrifices and bearing so much, you are to some extent at the mercy of geopolitical maneuverings that relate, for example, to domestic policies, politics, rather than the morality of the situation. Harvard historian Timothy Snyder today reminds everyone of just how much Ukraine is doing on NATO's behalf. He predicts that historians will look back at these two years of war and marvel at how much the Ukrainians did for our allies. And as we have discussed in an earlier webinar, so much depends on the civilian population being prepared to make the necessary sacrifices. We salute our colleagues. We can tell you, Anne, that your first paper was so rich in content that we were asked to organize some international reading groups to study it. We ended up with nine groups with simultaneous interpretation into Ukrainian, facilitated by an international team of analysts and academics with deep knowledge of the red and black books. The group started to meet the day after Russia rained over 80 cruise missiles on Ukraine. Some participants in the groups were in the dark, others were in a state of shock. Somehow, even though we met on Zoom, there was a deep intimacy in the groups that made it difficult for all of us, Ukrainians and non-Ukrainian, to part when the reading groups ended. In the months since then, we've had an extraordinary series of webinars in which eminent analysts and academics have partnered with Ukrainian analysts and therapists to explore some of the big themes arising from the war. The depth and richness of the material brought to us from Ukraine, in spite of their terrible stress, suffering, grief and exhaustion, has opened new realms of understanding and experience and has left us humbled. For myself and many in the WJ team, it's also about the relationships that we formed, the respect and affection we have for those colleagues we've got to know and our gratitude to them for all that they share with us and for their patience with us. There is an enormous gulf between the experience of those caught up in war and the rest of us. For a while, I wondered if we would ever be able to bridge it, but we are learning. And in that reaching across the divide, we are all enriched. 
Anna and Mito, you've been both been absolutely steadfast in your support of Ukraine. Today, as the war between Israel and Palestine draws attention away from Ukraine and adds yet more uncertainty with which our colleagues must contend, it is good to renew our support for our colleagues in Ukraine as they fight to live in freedom and as an independent nation. Today, we also extend a caring embrace to our colleagues from Israel, to those with close affiliations to Palestine, and to all those who are affected by the war in the Middle East, whether through family and friends, or by the frightening rise in anti-Semitism and Islamophobia. We are horrified by the massacre carried out by Hamas and at the ongoing hostage situation. We are appalled at the slaughter in Gaza and the situation in the West Bank and the human rights violations taking place in those areas. I'm going to say a few words about Israel and the Jewish people first. There is at least one colleague here today who has lost a friend in the massacre. As with our Ukrainian colleagues, we feel for you in your horror and grief. There are colleagues present who have family members who have been sent to fight in Gaza. The fear for their safety, the concern as to the long-term psychological effects on them and their families, perhaps one's own desire for revenge for the pain and suffering inflicted, the triggering of the unbearable suffering of generational trauma, but now also horror at what is being perpetrated in Gaza. Where does that even start in holding all of that? How is any of what is taking place going to help build peace in the future for which our colleagues crave? Many of us are painfully aware of the problem of acts being done in our name with which we strongly disagree. We hear also concerns that it may be dangerous to a voice criticism. As with our Ukrainian colleagues, some Israeli colleagues are in areas where there are frequent missile attacks. Mid-meeting, they rush for cover. They describe sweating in terror. Some of our colleagues have been working with those caught up in the massacre. We commend those of you who are trying, in spite of all that you are going through yourselves, somehow to help those who are traumatised by the horrors that have been unleashed. This must be very difficult work. It is impossible, I think, for us truly to understand how triggering these events are for people who have suffered the Holocaust, the Shoah, a huge trauma that came on top of previous pogroms. It's been part of my journey this year to try and open myself up more deeply to what happened in World War II by, for example, visiting the concentration camp near where my mother grew up. I know I am but dimly able to comprehend a suffering so extreme. As with racism and colonialism, it seems to me that we will only truly be able to say never again when we acknowledge our complicity in its legacy today. So our Israeli and Jewish colleagues suffer greatly and are confronted, even as they are in the midst of trauma, with issues of immense complexity. As a community, we can but be with you and try to support you as you suffer and struggle with it all. And we know that we too must also work. And now to Palestine. After the reading groups had finished, we held a debrief meeting of which an analyst and colleague with Palestinian roots spoke of her pain at the Jungian community, stirring itself to support our Ukrainian colleagues, but doing nothing much for Palestinians who had been living under occupation and in terrible conditions for so many years. Her grief, pain, anguish, sense of injustice and betrayal, powerlessness was there for us all to see. Since the massacre, the world has been forced to face the reality of the way the Palestinians have been treated over the years and to reflect our part in it, both historically and today. Widely respected Israeli-British historian Avi Shleim describes how the roots of this go back many decades to the Nakba in 1948, when three quarters of a million Palestinians were expelled from their homeland and the name Palestine was wiped from the map. He describes the Nakba as an ongoing process with an illegal annexation of East Jerusalem and the ethnic cleansing there. He worries that today we may be on the verge of a second Nakba. There is a huge disparity between the wealth, education, resources and support of the two sides. Within the Jungian world, we have three Israeli societies and no Palestinian ones. Although many analysts and others 
um, including Israeli, do speak up for the Palestinian situation. There is only one analyst, as far as I'm aware, with roots there. It's an enormous burden to bear. An Italian colleague sent me an article from the New York Times describing how the world protested against apartheid in South Africa and comparing it to the peaceful protests initially made by the Palestinians. As those peaceful protests were ignored, they became increasingly violent. Now we know what it takes to get the world to pay attention. Since the massacre, we are all forced to face the reality that some lives matter more than others, that we protect the strong against the weak, especially when we've not fully resolved our guilt at the unspeakable suffering inflicted on them, that we have double standards as to what is acceptable and by whom. Many of us are confronted with an ugly underlying racism within ourselves, of which we were largely unaware. So today we welcome also our absent colleagues into this space. We will keep the empty chair for them at the table. Speaking in the circumstances in which we meet today is difficult, and I apologize now if anything I or anyone else says causes hurt or offense. That is obviously not our intention. These matters are very complex and it, all, it is all very much a learning process. Within WJ, we have discussed whether we have a duty to speak or is it outside our remit? There is so little time to organize these events that there hasn't been sufficient time to give these difficult issues full consideration. We're learning as we go along. But these are grassroots community events. And so we would very much appreciate your reflections and your input. We all have different views, I'm sure. Please do get in touch and let us know yours. Whilst in great self-doubt this morning, I was eventually persuaded to proceed with the text that had somehow emerged by a short call I had with a friend of mine who is a rabbi, a wise and experienced man. I asked him to be honest with me about my draft. He called me back with his comments whilst traveling to a meeting on a London bus. He was quite positive and also made a few suggestions. Halfway through our discussion, he broke off and said, Catherine, I need to tell you that there is a man here on the bus who would like to talk to me and I would just indicate to him that we can talk in a moment. A minute or so later, he told me that more people on the bus wanted to talk with him. The people on the London bus were listening in on our discussion about the Holocaust, the Nakba, the massacre, hostages, Gaza, and they wanted to talk about it. I took it as a sign. And now, as always, we will hold our minute silence in which we remember and honor those who have died. We think of all of those who have died in Ukraine. We remember all who were killed in the massacre in Israel on October the 7th or have died at other times. We remember those who have died in Gaza and in the West Bank. We also hold in mind those who have been abducted from Ukraine, those who have been taken hostage, those who have maimed, those who have been denied the basic necessities of life, those whose homes have been destroyed and the very large number of people who have been displaced and are now refugees. We think of those who've been sexually violated, those who've been tortured, and those who are being denied their human rights. Thank you. I have been reflecting on the role of everyone else gathered here today, who I would now like to welcome also. We know that an important part of our role is just to be here. Our colleagues need to be with colleagues who are not in the war. Us all being here provides an important container. By helping to regulate the nervous system of our colleagues, we hope to give them space to breathe and to process some of the tsunami of complex material with which they are confronted. 
It seems to me that our role, particularly at the moment, is also to hold the opposites as best we can. If we can do that, we provide a function that people who are pushed into one side of an opposite cannot readily do themselves, especially when in the midst of trauma. As holding the opposites is so central to the emergence of the transcendent function, this is a vital role. So I welcome and I thank all of you who've turned up to support today. There's one final group of colleagues to be welcomed specifically today, and that is our Taiwanese colleagues who join us via the recording and also I noticed in the interpreters booth. This will be the last webinar before their elections. There is a risk that if Taiwan, Taiwan votes for democracy, it will be invaded by China and that Taiwan as it currently exists will be erased. We therefore hold our Taiwanese colleagues and also our Chinese colleagues in mind at this difficult time. Anna Missa, we thank you for being back with us today and we look forward to hearing from you very shortly now. Missa Berg will be introduced by Judy Cowell, an analyst in Cambridge in the UK. Anne Ulanov will be introduced by Elisabetta Passini, an analyst from Italy. Both are members of the WJ Steering Committee. Caterina Sarafidou, an academic based in London, will thank our speakers. There will then be very short notices from me. And as usual, we will finish with the prayer for Ukraine. And so now I hand over to Judy. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. So I'm really delighted to give a warm welcome to Missa Berg, who is the president of the IAAP. That's the International Umbrella Organization for Jungian Psychology. And another of her achievements, amongst many, has been to co-found the Danish Society of Analytical Psychology. Jung exhorted us to contribute to society, to give expression to the values we hold which arise out of our individuation journeys. And Mrs. Working Life shows us how actively concerned she has been to provide the Jungian analytical community with a place to belong together, to share those values. At the grassroots level of the WUJ's involvement with our Ukrainian colleagues, we have been learning from them and with them how our individuation journey and how Jung's individuation process described in the Red Book can be drawn upon at times of severe collective suffering. We are therefore very glad to see that Mr. Berg has set up a committee under the auspices of the IAAP to give in-depth reflection to what the fundamental values are of a Jungian community. And today she will speak to us briefly about those values. We are glad that she's accepted this invitation to join us today at this WUJ webinar. Her presence today signifies the value of communitas, that is at the heart of the WUJ. Welcome, Missa. Thank you very much for this nice introduction. Uh, and uh, dear, dear friends and colleagues, I'm delighted to speak at this very special occasion and Yulanov's presentation in response to the war between Israel and Palestine and the ongoing war in Ukraine, speaking to the unspeakable reflections on Jung's work and on the Red Book and the Black Books. One and a half years ago, and Yulanov gave a brilliant paper at the International Gathering in Solidarity and Support of Ukrainian Jungian Analysts. This remarkable event fostered an abundance of valuable initiatives, reading groups, social dream matrices, and the many ongoing webinars featuring internationally well-known analysts who together with Ukrainian colleagues have given so many memorable presentations. And today, on behalf of the IP, I would like to express my gratitude to Anne Yulanov for giving us all this opportunity once again to reflect deeply on the terrible wars that are now unfolding. Our gratitude also goes to our many dedicated colleagues in with Ukrainian Jungians who from the very start have been tireless in their management of support during this very difficult time. Today's world is becoming more and more polarized 
And it is so important that we in our Jungian community hold together against the strong splitting tendencies around us. As Jungian analysts and members of the IP, we are all bound by our constitution, which include non-discrimination on the basis of race, religion, ethnic origin, gender or sexual orientation with regard to activities of professional associations, training programs and public events. The IP is an international organization with the responsibility of containing the very diverse and often contradictory positions of all our members to the best of our ability. It is thus the responsibility of the IP administration to work for containment and against any discriminatory tendencies. We must support all our colleagues, whoever they are and wherever they live in the best possible way. It's also a general responsibility of the IP administration, again referring to our non-discrimination clause, to stand up for traumatized victims, regardless of origin, religion or ethnicity. We watch with deep sadness and concern the large groups of innocent people in Ukraine, in Israel and in Palestine, who live under tremendous stress from the brutal inhumanity of these two wars and who suffer from the trauma of terror and violence inflicted on them. May they and their loved ones all stay safe. In 1912, Sabina Spielrein published the article Destruction as the Cause of Coming into Being, and later mm -hmm. Freud embraced her ideas and developed a theory about a dialectic interplay in the psyche between the life drive eras and the death drive senators. In a healthy psyche, and we may add in a healthy society, eras and senators work together. Eros provides expansion and growth, sanitas limitations, and thereby the formation and strengthening of stable and permanent structures. But if sanitas breaks away from its attachment to Eros and instead, and instead takes Eros hostage, a completely different process begins aiming at bringing life under omnipotent control. Due to excellent Jungian trauma theories, we are familiar with how on the personal level Demonic archetypal defenses work in the service of Thanatos. But on the societal level, when Eros is taken hostage by Thanatos, we see dictatorship, corruption, greedy exploitation of weak groups and countries, violation of human rights, etc. And not least, war with all its horrific slaughters, systematic rapes, lies and deception, and with its ultimate threat of mass extinction. It is so important that we as Jungians do what we can to contain the polarization within ourselves and around us and the suffering wherever it occurs. To be able to do this, we need deep, deep reflection. And, and Yulanov's presentation today on speaking to the unspeakable will help us contain the unbearable. Thank you very much. Feel is better. Yeah. Good evening, uh, everyone. I am delighted to welcome today to the stage uh, Professor Anne Yulanov. Her inspiring speech more than one year and a half ago in May 2022 was the beginning of a long journey together. Since then, we as a group of Jungian colleagues have tried in many ways and in many different settings to create experiences of coming together, to share the grief and the despair caused by the war, and at the same time, to give and find support for our friends who have been deeply affected by the war. We live in troubled times in which a series of traumatic events have challenged our way of life increasing confusion, bewilderment, fear of the future, fear of the other identified as the enemy. Today, we have a lot of contents, but few containers for processing the experiences of cha or dramatic changes. Today, I believe 
we desperately need the common spaces for sharing that for sharing that are capable of transforming the harsh reality we we live in and making it clinically treatable. We believe that the eagerly awaited speech of Fan Yulanov this evening will certainly help us to find a way out of darkness. Now a few lines about her biography before we begin. Anne Belford Yulanov is an American academic and an internationally known and practicing Jungian analyst in New York City. She is Professor Emerita of Psychology and Religion at Union Theological Seminary and widely acclaimed lecturer in the USA and abroad. Anne is the author of over 20 books, including Religion and the Unconscious, Wisdom of Psyche, Healing Imagination, Finding Space. Throughout her work, the dialogue appears between spirituality, theology, religion, and their psychology and the distinctive voice of the feminine. She has received several honorary doctorate degrees and the Sapientia Doctrina and Oscar Feister Awards. She has been an active member of IAAP, Jungian Psychoanalytic Association, and the American Association of Pastoral Counselors. And now, well, thank you very much, Han, for being here today. And the stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. And thank you, Misser, for your kind words. Am I loud enough and can everybody hear me? Very okay. Good. Any problem, just raise your hand. So greetings, greetings. We're gathering together as students of Jung from around the world, far and near, to ask what his analytical psychology may suggest to us in this time of dire suffering, of rage and outrage, and above all fear in the face of impossible conflicts that yield no resolution. Here, more citizens join us, for it is now not just those who have contacts with people right in the wars, who are suffering intense anxiety, as if their hearts are squeezed tight, stiff, helpless to help the ones they love, the land they cherish, and the young whose childhood is stolen. I'm struck by everyone is consumed with this tension of holding in consciousness the intractable conflict that does not yield to logical reasoning and working out of strategies to end the bombing, the rockets, the noise and the stink of battle, the numbness of those in close up fighting for the long waiting until another attack. We're not observers anymore. We're not even witnesses. We're participants standing behind you who are up close. We're lending you whatever we can give for your support, including money. We share preoccupation with unspeakable images of suffering, adults within captured territories now forced to become people of the enemy country. And if you do not sign papers showing you comply with the imposed identity, you cannot get the medicine you need or the limited water quotient for your unlimited thirst. Worse yet, over 19,000 children have been transported to the enemy country for placement in educational camps to be instructed in the new language or the new history, which erases their citizenship in their own country. 
what does a parent or any of us do in the face of this abduction? We howl. Our bowels loosen or get stuck up in rage, but also in helplessness. So we're plunged into scapegoating the hated other with con convincing evidence of their malign intent to do us grievous harm. And they retaliate with hate and grievous harm with the same convincing evidence. All parties are faced with the threat of erasure and all respond with determined purpose, survival. Those citizens without water, food, or fuel to keep alive in the thundering bombs dropping, if we can hear them speak, say one thing, please, please help us. We have nowhere to lay one's head, wash our clothes, get medicine for our eye disease their own country and the enemy country treat those citizens with the same neglect. They're caught crowded in between warring parties. Those seeking the hydra head of enemy headquarters to end its intent to erase their own country from existence are maligned as villains, as if their friends and family abducted as hostages do not matter, nor the young at a dance party slain to an attack out of nowhere do not matter, nor the people alive in their safe rooms who would not come out to be shot were burned when their house around the safe room was set aflame. Everywhere the suffering is horrific. In this present explosion, decades of being occupied explode as well. Loss of homes, crowding, indignities, restrictions, and the sense it will never end. The hurt seems beyond repair. Some citizens exert transgressions against their own government, plea for the opposite cause of the victims, make a ceasefire, stop the unjust military exercise, save our own citizens from being seen as pariahs around the world. Let our leader hear these voices to make a more representative government. A young woman puts stickers on food parcels in the grocery store. She now faces a seven-year sentence. Whatever stance one takes, one is attacked for it, told it is grossly wrong. Only the opposite side is right. We outside your countries think of you in the midst of the war going on over 600 days and the war going on over eight weeks of days. We keep in mind your child, parent, friend, partner, your land, your buildings, your rivers, the air you breathe, all confronted with destruct destructive force aimed at you without regret. I beg your pardon for offending presumption to speak to the unspeakable you suffer daily that threatens to bury you alive in hopelessness and above all in loss. We admire your courage, your fortitude, your soul's capacities, your steadiness to fight for life, sanity, gratitude, love, in the midst of the madness of war. To respond to these wars and attempt to bring to them a Jungian perspective is an insurmountable task because we're dealing here with the very worst of human nature, affliction of evil. 
I beg your pardon in advance for anything I say that offends. This explosion of wars is like being hit with a high voltage of electricity that strikes one dumb. I turn to Jung's work and offer three possible sources of energy from it and from the red and the black books. One, individuation. It's central to Jung's recognition that psyche has an aim, imbues us with emotional purpose, and reminds us that if we connect to that force, we can better bear the unbearable. The aim goes on even in war, but hopelessness can shut down the impulse to individuate. Jung lost his soul, and you in war face existential choice to succumb in overwhelm by archetypal evil or choose to relate to it. Psyche's tell us moves us to become who we are, pick up bits and pieces of ourselves belonging to us, to seek and receive meaning, especially in times of meaninglessness. Jung saw the ongoing cooperation of conscious and unconscious to become aware of the tiny part we play in the wholeness of reality. That means absurdity, nonsense, meaninglessness is included in that wholeness too. Remember, Jung said of the bizarre figures he encountered in the red and black books, these were the most important images of my entire life. And I spend all the rest of my life to make clear to the rest of you, including even the dead, what these images mean. Even feeling as if dead inside, Jung says this, quote, if you will contemplate your lack of fantasy, of inspiration, and inner aliveness, which you feel as stagnation and a barren wilderness, and impregnate it with an interest born of alarm at inner death, then something can take shape, shape in you, for your inner emptiness conceals just as great a fullness, if only you will allow it to penetrate you. If you prove receptive to this call of the wild, the longing for fulfillment will quicken the sterile wilderness of your soul as rain quickens the dry earth. So even in war, we dream and images appear that engage our own, quote, mystery play, unquote, and an alchemical map marks we're going somewhere, round and round our major complex and the soul's aliveness until they become visible. It's not enough to have the image. It points beyond itself for us to use the red-blooded rubido of alchemy to step over into daily and collective life and live the new there. Maybe it urged you to join the war as a soldier or to serve as a medic or to take analyzons now who cannot pay or search imaginatively for a response to the pivotal question, after war, what? Jung says he doesn't know and can offer, quote, no great utterance, only a whisper of the inexpressible. Have a meal with me in silence. Perhaps the wall will speak. Perhaps it will speak from the fire. Stones will whisper something to you. From whom? 
he is not to be grasped, the supremely great one that robbed me of speech. Yet he stood near us and he filled me with the breath of eternity. Unquote. Jung's essay on the transcendent function proves of the greatest help because we are now again faced with wars as, quote, psychic epidemics manifested in evil actions harming each other. Jung asks, how does one come to terms in practice with the unconscious? The fundamental question of all religions and all philosophies for the unconscious is not this thing or that. It is the unknown as it immediately affects us. The transcendent function addresses how we may respond when we get stuck in unresolvable conflict, as we are now in these wars. It shows that each side of the conflict claims validity and must be accepted as it is for the conflict to transform. Understanding that necessity shocks us that opposing sides in war share similar processes. Each feels they are right, good, and say the opposite is wrong and to be repudiated. Hopelessness and suffering afflict both sides this is not moral equivalency. This is a fight of life and death. If we can bear the tension of holding consciously both sides of the conflict, something may appear. A new attitude, a new symbol, a whiff of something extraordinary a replacement seemingly out of the blue to the conflict, as if to point to what lies beyond the conflict. Something new may become visible and ready to embody it in real life. To be willing to exert, quote, brute strength, unquote, to hold this terrible tension, to wait in concentration, and not know from an ego point of view a solution to the conflicting views is to enter an experience of the, own, of the unknown affecting us. And with an insight that we could not invent. Jung comments that some of us say, this, is, this appearing feels like the voice of God. For himself, he chooses to, the, to use the word self as easier to explain in psychological terms. We wait. We are alert to what is unknown to become known. And we're amazed at what appears. It brings change, relief, and in rare moments, forgiveness. For, I, for our embroilment in evil that is contagious. Jung says consciousness is thimble size in compared to the vast unconscious. Jung reminds us in treatment and in war to work within what is possible, within our limits. Two, personal and collective. Caught in the maelstrom of collective violence in these two wars, each side bearing a long archetypal history, it's hard to do one's personal individuation work. Collective events, archetypal forces surround us on all sides. They seep into our personal opinions, and we can tell they do by the extremity of our opposite emotions. Hatred now with the wish to kill, 
sorrow as flooding. Failure to do the individuation work leaves a hole in consciousness. And that is where the unconscious, archaic, archetypal forces seep in. Before we know it, we're unconsciously identified with this blaze of archetypal image, swept up in anger, burning into rage, or identified with Rachel or Madonna, weeping for the losses of humanity to evil. Unconsciously identified with the great whoosh of archetypal energy inflating us and not yet able to act on the necessity of disidentifying with the archetype. We're taken over by the energy. It moves us, not through our ego, but overwhelming it and its power thrills us or daunts us if our identification is negative and we're crushed by a deflation. We become the plaything of archetypal energy, a piece of seaweed caught in the wave's current. If not checked, the identification lure, lures us further to identify as the messenger of this power, the one who sees where the energy goes or should go, and now we choose to serve it, no matter the consequences. In those moments of becoming the messenger, we may even go further and see ourselves as the source or purpose of this inflation, willing to risk all, meaning other people, the land, the air, captured by its driving power. The archetypal force takes on a godlike quality, which we now represent. That identification tricks us into releasing atavistic impulses ordering the killing of a whole people, push them into the sea, use babies as weapons of war, use repeated rapes of women, including breaking their pelvis, take hostages, all in an effort to destroy the enemy's determination to fight. Being in the grip of the force of the unconscious is terrifying even if thrilling. It happens in creative ventures too, but they're checked by communication, consultation with others. That effective step of disidentification puts the archetypal creative idea outside us and elicits concentration on its force as something we must relate to, not identify with ourselves. This is very hard to do at any time, and people do it. In war, disidentification is desperately hard, desperately hard to do when our dearest loved ones fall victim to atavistic atrocity. Revenge fantasies can overtake us. If erasure is the signal threat we face in our present individuation process, whether at the hands of the enemy outside us or under the scold of self-defeat inside us, condemning our numbness, our exhaustion, our fear for everyone, including ourselves, then in the relation of personal to collective life, the banner is to fight for our land, for the best, not the worst of our government, for the vulnerable, including ourselves. Here we face archetypal forces aroused in war that gather into a cultural complex that crowd out our personal effort to find the right way to relate to our hate, our guilt, and evil. The place of hate, I suggest, 
is as the first protest against being erased. Its smoldering can explode into violence, unimagined, murder, suicide. Hate can be held in check by our consciousness using, quote, brute strength, unquote, to imagine holding the tension of opposites in mind. That means allowing a clarity, a frank beholding of one's own shadow enmity and those of our collective groups and cultures. That means to see the enmity, to smell it, hear it, hear its seething rage, boiling furiously to do this or that harmful thing to the other who attracts our hate. With fierce resolve, we aim to hold this strife consciously without acting it out in attitude or violence that such rancor triggers. Instead, we use that energy to see the side right there next to hating that yearns not for wreckage of land, but for its beauty, not for victory over defeat, but something beyond both. Psyche may push beyond blockages because its main activity is creative images. We may be moved to reaching for the dot of good, of light, in the gloom of snarling and yelling, in the pulls of death dealing attractions. This is a fight and a contemplation. A practical example. I have imagined that analysts from opposite warring countries and political positions refuse to be in the same room with one another. Both suffer firsthand the cultural complex of evil bearing down on awful wounds inflicted by war at the hands of the other side. It is unspeakable to be in the same place together. I was startled by an image that appeared. Say to each person, stay at the door. Do not go into the room. Stay at the door. See what shows up in yourself. See the other standing at a different door to the room and not entering it. Be curious. What are they feeling? What thoughts come? What instinctive impulses boil up? Stay at the door. See the other. Imagine the other's otherness to my position and heartache. What is the emotional field between us? Stay at the door. Let the room stay empty. Wait to see what psyche initiates. In the midst of destructions of all kinds, including our inner capacities to hope, think, feel at depth, let alone our wrecked homes, stores, public meeting spaces, parks, trees, zoos, guilt grows up. To realize we harm, we can do, and hence have done to each other, both me to you in thought, word, and deed, and my culture and my country to yours, can overwhelm us. It is personal and collective. Jung's discussion of true guilt helps. True guilt is not legal nor moral guilt, but true in the psychological sense of our very own link to collective guilt. We feel addressed, implicated, as though we, even though we are not personally involved in this specific destructive action. Jung discovered in the Red Book, although he had not done the evil deed, he knew he could have. Because we're connected to our neighbor, 
by, quote, unconscious humanity, unavoidably drawn into the uncleanness of evil, no matter what our conscious attitude may be, for we are all so much a part of human community, unquote. We carry our part, hoping it subtracts one smear of evil from shared existence with others. Jung sees true guilt as impacting our individuation process. I register the grave harm I can do to you. True guilt is our own. Its weight is real. Accepting guilt brings us into direct relation to evil. True guilt consolidates our personality when we reckon with this shadow and see it is up to us to find a redemptive act because an evil act must be expiated. We bear the dishonor, ignominy, and want to find the dot of good and cling to it for all our sakes. Evil. The serpent turns up early in Jung's red and black books and takes an uncommon interest in Jung. He refers to it as she, wandering now in this direction to good and in that direction to evil, playing a decisive part in Jung's transformation. Serpent is one of the three parts of Jung's soul. The other two are Salome and a part called soul. Salome is matter where the light first shows itself and must be created by us to show light more fully through the, quote, highest lights, science and art, unquote. From matter are birthed images that convey meaning to us, and the soul part loves those and works with them. The serpent is the third part of the whole soul and plays a crucial role in our facing the reality of evil. The serpent as third part of the soul is the earthly essence of us, and can veer toward evil that we need to claim as belonging to us. Jung discovers if we own the serpent in us, namely our capacity to veer toward evil, then it is within reach of our ego to learn to relate to evil, quote, staring at us coldly, unquote neither possessed in identification with its supposed power, nor denying that it is there. We must contend with it. That difficulty and mission of shadow in us that causes harm to others, whether we intend it or not, and much worse when we do intend harm, in rage or acted out hatred or vengeance or sheer malice. Amazingly, according to Jung, the serpent protects us. You own your serpent in yourself. That protects us from projecting it outward onto others unconsciously, projecting evil outside us into the neighbor, creating a demon we blame and accuse, throws evil out into the spaces between us and others free to roam wherever, to contaminate a great range of people, not subject to any ego restraint, free to cause mayhem everywhere. Conscious of serpent in ourselves keeps awareness of evil in, in mind, so it does not fall back into unconsciousness and automatically get projected outward. Owning that serpent as part of us keeps us from spreading foul-smelling filth of evil. But once the soul is lost, 
the soul turns, quote, into a terribly malign serpent or into a tiger that pounces on the unsuspecting from behind. The pounce leaves us unanchored in relating to evil outside ourselves, and then the devil can snatch us up, spreading infection that smells of human blood. Three, another note from the feminine. When Jung discovers a way to make, quote, the unsayable experiential, quote, it is through a feminine mode personified by Salome in her new form. This was so far from Jung's usual approach that he got into a tangle with Salome, arguing with her, insisting she explain herself and tell her mystery. We remember early on in the Red Book, Salome uh, is a murderous, uh, blind, uh, mad woman. And Jung saw early on in the Red Book, he had to dethrone his identification with what he called his masculine thinking, reasoning, logical, ruling principle, his superior function to perceive and understand reality. And he did dethrone it. But traces remained. Here he was still wanting to understand, wanting a rational explanation of her point of view after Salome had transformed into a loving woman who regained her sight. She would not yield to Jung's insistent arguing. He even appealed to the soul part of his soul to explain Salome. But this soul part claimed Salome as her sister and hence rejected Jung's cry for help and sent him back to uh, Salome. Remember, Salome represents a third part of Jung's soul. A feminine point of view now inhabited him, and he could not get around her. Salome stood for herself and her approach to life, exposing Jung's, quote, power devil, unquote, in trying to understand everything and push her into his masculine approach. Jung yielded. Something different was here. It did not compute with his explaining things in reasonable words or images. He heard her say she was matter, and matter is where the light first appears. Let matter be. Experience it, because you must allow all parts of life to live. Do not reduce them to what you can understand. The whole of reality is bigger, larger, and matter before words and images. Births images the soul part of his soul receives and dwells with the meanings they convey. Facing the intractable conflict of these wars, we need a new approach not unlike the leap, L-E-A-P, leap, we find in the working of the transcendent function, where a new attitude or symbol or action appears out of the blue. Whatever it is, we know neither ourselves or the person we may be working with, neither the therapist or the client invented it. It appears. It happens after long studying readiness to examine the conflict closely, consent not to not knowing how its irreconcilability is to be solved. We relent from our hubris of consciousness as if presuming ego efforts, both individual and collective, can do anything if we just force self and others 
to comply. Yet the inestimable value of consciousness may also make itself felt. We note a conscious alert to a glimmer of hope in the midst of the battle. Or that odd coincidence that granted us reprieve from being wounded. Or a whiff of happiness, even in war, and our unexpected ability to feel it, know it, give good, glad thanks for it. It is amazing. So what is the leap to a different approach? To understand the leap, five parts of it began to differentiate, and I'll list them for clarity's sake. First, it's a leap to not knowing, humbled by our, quote, thimble-sized consciousness, unquote, in comparison to the vast unconscious. Information does not come to us. Instead, we're impressed by, consent to, the priceless value of consciousness that ushers us body and soul into the immediate here and now. So we experience what happens. It does not pass us by. We may not understand it, but we wake up to something that happens. As people concerned with consciousness in relation to the unconscious, our companion is always uncertainty and darts of astonishing insight. As people concerned with the depth of psyche, what do we imagine we may contribute to quiet the noise of war and to dissolve impossible conflict in a, quote, world inflamed everywhere that the flame of madness whips up, unquote. Second, our leap employs something similar to Jung's leap to accept Salome, personifying a feminine sensibility, waking up to matter and the light in it that accepts letting parts, all parts of life, to be accepted. This dawning of light in matter, the material existence we share, shows that we start with an evident commonality among us, on which we could build through ego capacities more light through the words and images. Those higher lights of art and science have to do with meanings that quicken our soul, but without the tough acceptance that we all come from dust, we all exist in this primordial way, we can strategize about meanings, but we do not live connected deeply to what fundamentally matters before words and images. We know in this leap of imagination in consciousness that, quote, beginnings may be protected in the darkness of not knowing, unquote. Third, a leap includes fearful facts about the role of destructiveness in living. Jung says the symbol of self, its images, seeks its own destruction. If overly concretized into a weapon to bully others or to evade the reality the image points to, there we are again, identified with an archetypal infusion of colossal energy, and we insist everyone else identify with our version of it too. Also, the self will destroy its symbolism if it becomes overly spiritualized and wafts off into the song of the river with no one actually experiencing it getting wet in the here and now. Destructiveness will be used to free up the reality self-images point to, 
that reality will not be trapped by spiritualizing or concretizing. That reality brings livingness, not spiritual meanderings, nor reified idols. Fourth, a leap takes in Jung's saying, we must understand, quote, we are threatened with universal genocide if we cannot work out our way of salvation by symbolic death. Symbolic death, as I understand it, is a deep shift in psyche. A leap may yield to this deep shift. In order to do therapeutic work with others, we experience as patients in our own lives forms of symbolic death, what alchemy describes as dismemberment, scattering, fragmenting, mortif mortificatio, putrefactio. We feel pushed into a deep shift toward the unraveling of ego plans and purposes, including even good values, as well as power plays, and indolent carelessness of not bothering to do the work of differentiation of our small place in the wholeness of the whole. We get confronted with shadow limits of our ego as boss, just as Jung's soul accused him of inflated competitiveness, throwing in Latin quotations when he spoke to prove he was the smartest and also succumbing to, quote, kindergarten emotions, unquote. The shift a, le a leap leads to is seeing that ego management in its old forms is being undone. Jung is, quote, carving out a space between the gods and hell for the human, unquote and thus living out his discovery, the transformation, if it happens, comes to us, emerges from our inferior function. He claims the feminine and feeling are his inferior function, and he leaps with Salome's toughness into the treasure of human love, quote, warm human love, blood, warm red blood, the holy source of life, the unification of everything separated and longed for. Love belongs to me, not the gods who know no measure and no mercy. Unquote. Jung even fights the soul who would carry off the warm red-blooded human love to heaven for her own salvation. No, he yells, it is mine. It's ours. It belongs to humanity in this here and now finite earthly life. And his soul concedes. Fifth, this leap or emerging shift from ego in charge changes our experience of opposites in the chaos and destruction of everything in war. You are suffering up close forms of symbolic and real death. We learn from you. We too, right behind you, carrying the anguish of war, feel forms of a shift from the reign of ego management that cannot stop violences breaking out in our world to something else emerging we do not know or define yet. The enemies, each standing at a different door of the room they will not enter together because of hatred between them and acute suffering at each other's hands, remains a potent image to me. Ego strategies to mend this rift that is so deep it is a chasm between them displays, I suggest, a new form of opposites. The opposites mix up and happen simultaneously, not now to be yanked together from being split far apart. 
Now we feel them all together, the immeasurable value of consciousness right up against the hubris of consciousness, the hatred right up close to the kinship as fellow sufferers of wounds and intents of war, as sisterly sufferers of the slandering of truth in war. As Jung notes, the opposites of good and evil are together as long as we are growing, but fall back into lethal rivalry when we stop growing. The old form of opposites, formerly split far apart in strife, changes to be felt together up close, holding that tension of their bundling together in consciousness without acting them out, pushes toward a bursting of old forms of the reign of ego to focus now on the field between us that holds us. A shift occurs from who has the power to the content and the effects of the field. These five changes come in a leap. I summarize them. Knowing nothing, accepting a feminine mode of letting all parts have a share in life, self-destroying itself, its images, if they're overly concretized or overly spiritualized. Symbolic death is required to avoid genocide, and the opposites bundle together in each of us and between us. The field is what we shift to where the, land, the leap lands us. The shift causes the leap, and the leap causes the shift. The field evokes our shared origin story, being created from the same source in matter, in stardust, all created in a basic unity, which means opposites present as mixed close up with each other, even evil coinciding with good in each of us and between us. The field shifts the focus now, not on competing ego systems of meaning, but on the emotional, physical, spiritual, material, somatic, conscious and unconscious field in which we dwell. The field is pictured as the empty room with us standing at the different doors. We experience our otherness to each other and the otherness in face of whatever psyche seems to be doing in us and between us. Each of us accepts our distinctness and we sense the other's distinctiveness. Individuation creates diversity, and diversity strengthens individuation. Psyche is after a bigger field, larger than what our egos can imagine. In this field, we may not yet hear what the other says, nor any words I say, will be heard by the other. But our psyche may hear the words of the other psyche, and the other psyche may register words of our psyche. They touch, they affect each other through the unconscious. We may grow to see this field exists everywhere, between individuals and other living things, with a giraffe, with a tree, a stone, with all sentient and cosmic being. The focus on field is urgent in war. We need a sense, its sense of unity. Just imagine if we were attacked from something from outer space. We would all assemble quickly to unity as earth beings. The wars still fool us that we can negotiate and strategize differences into treaties that work. We long for such treaties and are indebted to them, but they're not yet working in these costly wars. 
we need the addition of imagining the psychic leap and recognition of the entire field which is larger than our killing each other. People drawn into Jung's work in conscious and unconscious may be a source of such imagining. Matter, meaning, hate, true guilt, serpent, all exist in the field. May be a source that we can imagine comes from the field. We gain a new register for feeling in ourselves and in each other that we may imagine what lies beyond our blockages and influence each other in that direction. This field calls to our attention the mysterious notion across cultures and historical periods of subtle body, thought to make a bridge between mind and body, human and divine, psychic and spiritual concepts. It recognizes psyche is matter and matter is psyche and the connection between macrocosm and microcosm. Jung cites his discovery of a greater field in which to live. He says, quote, he is a grain, a piece of sand, a seed dropped into nothingness from which greening will come. There's a kernel in himself, in all of us, that he must trust. That way, he finds his place in the middle between the gods and the unconscious, between good and evil, in the space of a new body that alchemy calls the subtle body. This inspired me to seek that dot of good hidden in you, around you, in the other, at the other door, you in war, and we behind you, imagining what you go through, to hold to a dot of good in all the shambles of evil. Clinging to a dot of good, I suggest, is a working out of salvation akin to symbolic death. The opposites together, a reaching for it across all the years of our personal lives and in collective sacred traditions, that harbor good and recognize evil, but ever to be confined to its constricted place. In all the ways of your present suffering in these wars and hostage taking and hostage releasings, and who will release its sufferers from the trauma of being turned into a thing to be used to hurt the enemy? The dot of good is findable as a dot, to comfort you, to strengthen you, to bolster your courage. The dot of good allows us, when standing at the different doors to the empty room, to behold the matrix of becoming. With respect and thanks. Thank you very much, Anne, for this remarkable presentation. Uh, and, and thank you, Misser, for affirming the IAAP's unequivocal commitment to non-discrimination uh, and also the IAAP support to traumatize victims of war and displacement wherever this takes place. And it truly is at all order for me to respond within the five minutes that I have to the images and the reflections that you have given us in your presentation today. It is a year and a half after your first presentation. Uh, and as you say, today finds us meeting once again around war rather than peace as we had all hoped for at that time. I think that your talk captures the sentiment 
so many of us share at this moment in time about how impossible it is to comprehend or digest the images and experiences of unspeakable suffering, anxiety, chaos in which large parts of the world are submerged at the moment. It is, I think, also very difficult to negotiate the near crucifying burden of managing impossible moral and practical conflicts that have no obvious resolution and which challenge our understanding of humanity. I find, however, uh, that, that your reflections and the threads that you weave into your talk, individuation, the interface between personal and collective, the feminine, uh, I find that these offer us perhaps a certain flickering light in the darkness, as Jung says, uh, by connecting us to his work in the Red Book and the Black Books. I believe that this work, which he was writing during and around the First World War, offers, in fact, a symbolic framework that can provide meaning and sustenance to the human spirit under the most difficult of hardships. For better or worse, I think that the challenges that we face today mean that we cannot retreat into an entirely individual process, even if we wanted to. As Jung says, the suffering of mankind is reflected in the individual's predicament and vice versa. Uh, at the end of his life in 1960, Jung writes that the realization that nothing human is alien to me which mm. is a realization that he comes for the first time uh, to in 1914. He says that this realization is not just an insight, but it is also a duty. So the idea that nothing human is alien to me is a duty. Um, you mentioned the need for a collective leap into a new way of relating to these impossible conflicts. Uh, and where this leap takes us first is the darkness of not knowing, which I think is the root of all beginnings. It is also, I suggest, the darkness of the soul, which sends up unrecognizable urges. It is an unknown image of the soul, which hollows out and hacks up the shapes of our culture and our history. Our ability to dwell in this space of not knowing allows us to encounter and come to terms with unknown and rejected aspects of our own psyche and of the collective psyche. We experience, as you say, our otherness to each other and the otherness within. In Jung's Black Books, uh, his descent into the underworld is followed not only by an encounter with the luminous God image, but in fact, in April 1914, right before the First World War begins, his descent into the, the underworld is followed. It is accompanied by an encounter of the opposite. So the God's hellish brother, the image of the Antichrist. It is this encounter, he says, that turns everything upside down for him. And it is only this way that can unite in him what has been separated. He says in April 1914 that up until that point, I loved the beauty of the beautiful, the spirit of those rich in spirit, the strength of the strong. I laughed at the stupidity of the stupid. I despised the weakness of the weak the meanness of the mean, and hated the badness of the bad. But now, now I must love the beauty of the ugly, the spirit of the foolish, the strength of the weak. I must admire the stupidity of the clever, respect the weakness of the strong, and the meanness of the generous, to honor the goodness of the bad. I suggest that through the burden of individuation, Love, as Jung says, triumphs. Our values are now shifting and our only certainty, I think, is that the new world will be something very different from what we were used to. This deep shift allows for the emergence of what you have described 
to us today as the field, which you have pictured as an empty room of sorts, with us standing at different doors. These doors, I suggest, are symbols. They are gates. As Jung says in January 1914, the way of individuation enters through death. When we are surrounded by rot and horror, it rises in darkness and leaves the mouth as the saving symbol. The field, as you say, contains our shared origin story and a sense of unity, which can, I think, contain certain states of despair and allow something entirely new to take place. Spirit, as Jung says, before the Second World War, this time we're in the midst of the Second World War, 1941, he says that spirit cannot be learned. It is given to us by grace, and grace cannot be had by force or reason. We have to be gripped, and the one who is gripped can grip others. So, Anne, I join you and your audience in your gripping invitation for a holy contemplation of that dot of good to nurture an inner light of illumination and peace. Thank you. Thank you. Very wise. Can't Unmute, wait. Claire. Thank you, Katerina. Thank you, Catherine, for telling me um, how to follow that up. But I will do. It was night in some unknown place, and I was making slow and painful headway against the mighty wind. Dense fog was flying along everywhere. I had my hands cupped around the tiny light which threatened to go out at any moment. Everything depending on my keeping this little light alive. Suddenly, I had the feeling that something was coming up behind me. I looked back and I saw a gigantic black figure following me. But at the same moment, I was conscious in spite of my terror that I must keep my little light going through night and wind, regardless of all dangers. You may have recognized Jung's dream and know that this tiny light was his consciousness. When I hear Anne speak about the need for brute strength to hold, to wait, to not know, I am reminded of Jung's last words in this dream, regardless of all dangers. For those of us not directly involved in the war against Ukraine, in the war between Israel and Palestine, or in the many, too many other wars we are hardly hear in the world. One way to use brute strength is to give as generously as we can afford of our time and money for each webinar we attend. And once again, a very heartfelt thank you to all who have donated over the past 19 months. Nearly 60,000 pounds sterling were donated to WUJ on the GoFundMe platform since May 2022. In 2023, 23,000 were donated. Approximately 10,000 pounds were distributed to Ukrainian colleagues in the spring, and another 10,000 will be distributed in the next few days, with each time to approximately 40 individuals who suffer severe financial hardship and continue to work regardless of all dangers. The rest was used to pay out for our incredible and ever-present professional Ukrainian interpreters. The year is closing, but the WUJ webinar series continues into the new year. And despite all dangers of living crises around the world, thank you for keeping this tiny light alive and for continuing to donate and to be present to these webinars. Please click on the link which is shared on the chat now, and you'll be able to make a donation when the webinar has ended. Thank you, everyone. And thank you very much, Claire, for all the work that you do for WJ, and thank you to everyone 
um, who puts in so many hours of work behind the scenes. Thank you to everyone who's been involved in today's webinar. It's This webinar has required a huge amount of time and care and thought. Thank you to our interpreters and to Sanctus Media. We have an excellent lineup of eminent Jungians and impressive Ukrainian presenters for the spring term. We're hoping to release the spring term flyer shortly, but Tom Singer and Daria Kunchenko will kick things off for us on Tuesday, the 16th of January. And although it will be in the middle of the night, Pi Chen Su from Taiwan will be in the chair. And now the time has come to say goodbye. On behalf of everyone involved in WJ, we pray that all our colleagues and their loved ones in Ukraine, Israel and Palestine and elsewhere stay safe. We pray that a just peace may be negotiated, respecting the dignity, equality and human rights for people. For those of you, especially our Ukrainian colleagues who celebrate Christmas, we wish you a happy Christmas in spite of the war. The divine child and archetype was born in an occupied country and to parents forced to leave their home and subsequently to flee their country to avoid a massacre. As the solstice reminds us, after the long darkness, a small light appears and the sun begins to rise again. I invite you to stay just two minutes longer so that we can play together the prayer for Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, and goodbye.